We're going to get started here momentarily with our next panel. This morning, I made an effort to thank family members for making the trek and being here in person to support our students. I also thanked project sponsors and stakeholders for their investment in our student projects. But I also want to take a moment to thank funders. So if you have had anything to do with queuing up funds for our students to incentivize their project work, thank you. Every year we have agency staff, nonprofit staff, even private individuals line up resources for our students. And this work that you're seeing in these three days of the community forum would not be possible without substantial external support. So a very sincere thank you to everyone involved. But for now, it's time to get back to our students. So it is a real privilege to introduce Sarah, Dylan, Shane, Caitlin, and Alyssa. Welcome to the stage. Hi, our panel is titled Fish, Forests, and Fire. Each of our projects will discuss changing ecological conditions in some capacity, either as a result of climate change, human intervention, or deliberate lack of human intervention, and what potential implications these changes have on ecosystems and or land management. We will briefly introduce ourselves, our project titles, their geographic place in the world, and how they inform management responses. First, we'll start in the water, then we'll move to the forest, and we'll finish up with fire. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm an MS Ecology student. My project is centered around investigating how widespread gill lice are in Colorado, finding the most reliable way to detect gill lice in the field, and how genetically diverse different populations of gill lice are across the major Colorado drainages. Knowing these factors will help shape the future of Colorado fisheries across Colorado. Hi, um, I'm Dylan Sampson McKenna, uh, Master's in Ecology. Um, my project is titled Longitudinal Changes in human hunted and unhunted species occupancy in a Honduran cloud forest, a pre and post COVID-19 comparison located in Kasuko National Park, Honduras. And um, yeah, our takeaway is that COVID-19 has really context specific effects on human activity and resulting effects on wildlife populations as well. My name is Shane Kalinske. I'm a master's of environmental management candidate. My project is located in the Taylor Park Basin and it's uh, <clears throat> modeling forest understory temperatures to better inform land managers on silver culture practices and forest decisions. My name is Caitlin Harvey and my project is on alpine plant community dynamics and climate in the Senator Beck Basin of Colorado, which will hopefully help inform preemptive management strategies in high alpine ecosystems across Colorado. My name is Alyssa Warsham. I'm a master's of environmental management candidate in the integrative and public lands management track. The title of my project is when the wilderness burns current wilderness fire management and the case for prescribed fire. Um, this project involved qualitative research and facilitated discussions with participants all over the country with a focus on the Western US. And uh, we hope it will influence fire management policy making and policy implementation within designated wilderness areas. And with that, uh, we will start with Sarah first. Well, my name is Sarah Prokash, and as I mentioned, my project is on gill lice. Um, it's titled a Statewide Survey of the Distribution and Genetic Diversity of the Gill Lice on Macola, California, in Colorado. Next, please. So, gill lice are parasitic copepods that live on the genus of Salmonids called Oncorungus. In Colorado, this includes rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, and coconut salmon. Um, they attach themselves to the skin, fins, and gills of these fish and feed on their blood and mucus. And once they're attached, they cause eroded gills in fish, which can lead to stunted growth, reduced fecundity, and fatigue. It's not great. And <laughs> <laughs> um, the largest physiological risk for um, a fish acquiring gill lice is actually size. Larger fish are at a higher risk than smaller fish ever getting gill lice. And that's likely because larger fish circulate more water over their gills and expose themselves to their oxygen in their stage of gill ice. Next, please. 
they're commonly associated with aquaculture and have been in Colorado since at least the 1880s, which is also coincidentally when rainbow trout were introduced to the state. And they've been reported as far east now as West Virginia and are suspected to have come from the American West Coast, hence the name Californiensis. So these parasites have a direct life cycle um, with multiple life stages from egg to rabbit female, um, which usually takes from 60 to 75 days. Um, and this requires uh, external factors such as water temperature, gill lines mature faster in warmer water temperatures. So sometimes that can be accelerated. And um, gill lines will develop and mature faster in those waters. Yeah, and the eggs hatch between 28 and 32 days depending again on water conditions, and they'll come into this nauplia stage after hatching, which lasts less than an hour usually. And then they become the mobile infectious stage known as the copepodid, where they will swim across river, river beds looking for shadows and attached fish that way. And they don't have very long to do this, they only have a few days before they die. Um, but if they do find a good host, they will attach and then start molting. And from there, they become a calamus. And they molt a couple more times as a calamus and become a mature adult copepod. And adult females will stay attached to the fish for about two months and will produce on average two broods. But as well, normal water temperatures become more common, we've been seeing more than two broods per female at times. Um, so seeing that gill lice are a threat to Colorado fisheries, we have set out to one, investigate the potential upstream range expansion of gill lice in Colorado. Two, to compare um, eDNA detection methods with physical detection methods um, in the field. And then three, to investigate how genetically diverse populations are across the state in different drainages. So here's a map of where the have been reported in the recent past. Um, I use this map as a reference to pick my own sites. I picked some sites from this map where gill lice were found. And then I also picked a couple where gill lice were not tested for, just to kind of have a better look at their range. Next, please. And so here's where I ended up sampling each star represents a river that I sampled, and each of these stars uh, were broken into three separate locations, uh, three separate sites an upstream site, a midstream site, and a downstream site. And this was just done to kind of get an idea of where gill lice infected fish like to hang out and if they are progressing upstream or not. Um, so in total, I did, I sampled 47 sites across the state. But before getting too far into the methods, I just want to make sure everyone knows what eDNA is. eDNA stands for environmental DNA, and it is DNA shed by organisms into the environment. It can be picked up in air, soil, snow, water. And it's a very useful tool in early detection of cryptid, of, of invasive species, but as well as cryptic species. So any animals that are hard to detect, which is very useful. Um, in the case of gill lice, we do this by taking water samples and detecting DNA in that. So, like I mentioned, um, we, we sampled the eDNA using water samples, um, and we use these one liter bottles like the one in the picture. On one end, we put a filter that's um, specifically designed to catch eDNA, and on the other end, we would attach a bike pump, and we would just force water through that um, filter with that light pump until water could not physically pass through. And usually that took less than one bottle because river were gross. And <laughs> then to keep the DNA from degrading, we'd add a TE buffer and put it on ice until it could be put in the freezer and analyzed. Um, so in addition to testing eDNA at each location, we also did some physical sampling with electrofishing. And any of these susceptible fish, the rainbow trout, the cutthroat trout, the coconut salmon that we caught, we would measure those, weigh them, and then check in their gills, their mouths, and behind their fins for gill lice, all the usual hunts where we expect to find them. Um, and if we didn't find any lice, then the fish would let go back where we caught them. Uh, but if we did find lice, then we would do, um, we would look at where the lice were on the body and Make a note of that and how many lice total there were. And we would take up two lice, up to two lice per fish, and keep them individually at 95% ethanol. So we can do some genetic sequencing and see how close related all these lice are. So in total, we sampled 1,803 fish across the state. Um, and at, 40, um, at 10 of these 47 locations, 
um, they tested positive using eDNA. And then at 15 of these locations, they tested positive for gill lice using physical sampling. And then, so here you can see that eDNA detected gill lice more in the midstream and downstream locations. But then physically, we found lice more in the upstream and midstream locations. And I'll go into more of why we think that is momentarily. Uh, and then here, you can see our eDNA percentages compared to our physical detection percentages. Um, purple represents negative results, meaning that lice were not detected. And red represents sites that were, you know, they, they were present. And if you look at the ones with red on them, you'll see that most of them do not mirror each other. The only one that does is the Blue River, where you can see that 60% of all fish were infected, and then 60% of all the water samples we took came back positive for gill lice, which is interesting. But then you'll also see that um, at the Taylor River, we found that 40% of the fish were infected with gill lice. But then the, you know, when we looked at the eDNA stuff, none of those came back positive. We even tried a second time and sampled them twice and still nothing really weird. Um, but then something else interesting is whenever I sampled the Orofano and the San Miguel rivers, I did not physically find lice, but then eDNA detected them there. So that's kind of cool. And then here, just to make it easier, I put everything into a chart so we can see what water I sampled, how many fish I looked at, what species of fish I looked at, how many lice we found, and then compared those percentages again. And for your reference, RBT stands for rainbow trout, CT stands for cutthroat trout, um, the HHN and the RXN stand for rainbow trout and cutthroat trout hybrids. And then KOK at the bottom there stands for kokanee salmon. And you can see that our winner for the most gill lice was the South Platte River. It's 221 lice found when we went sampling, which is pretty crazy. And then here are our genetics results. Um, we found 14 distinct haplotypes, which are just genetic variations of a gene. Um, across uh, the 57 lice that I sent in for analysis, as well as some lice that we had on hand from Pennsylvania and Oregon, of the same species that we used to compare that to. And I'll go more into these results and why they are super cool in a minute. So back to where gill lice like to hang out in the rivers, it looks like they're more likely to occupy upstream and midstream environments. And I'm gonna say that you, despite the contradicting results, um, that's most likely because the eDNA was shed by lice at the top of the rivers and it got washed downstream where you picked it up. And one possible explanation for why gill lice infected fish tend to be further upstream is because they might be struggling a little bit to get oxygen. So they might be going further upstream into cooler, more oxygenated waters to be able to breathe easier. That's really the only explanation I can come up with. And finally, it looks like eDNA sampling is less reliable overall than physical sampling at the moment. I do think it has potential, but as of right now, um, if you have low densities of trout and low densities, low densities of lice, you're probably not going to pick it up. Even if you do 30 or more samples, you might come up with nothing. And at that point, taking the eDNA samples is so tedious and time consuming. And you have to have all this equipment, you have to have a cooler on hand. It's not super simple. I would think it was just easier to get in there and shock the fish instead. <laughs> but, yeah. and then back to our genetics results, we found those 14 distinct genetic variations of this mitochondrial gene. And what's interesting about this is that we have some overlap between the Colorado River, South Platte River, and Pennsylvania. Um, so that would indicate that these all came from a common source. And that would kind of indicate that they came from the West Coast altogether. Um, they've been here, we can presume since the 1880s, it's probably when they were introduced, they might have come a little bit later, but we know that they've been here for at least a few decades, enough time to accrue some different mutations, just based on how many we have here. But overall, there's not as much genetic variation as we would think if they were a native species. So this does have management implications. Um, it shows that detecting gill lice with eDNA is possible, and it also shows that although it might not be ready to be used in the field right now, it does have great potential on hatchery use where fish are really squeezed in together and there's less water volume to look at. And if regulations ever get put into place forbidding the spread of gill ice from hatcheries, this could be a really great tool to enforce that. 
and a lot of work went into this project. And I just want to thank everyone at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Western Colorado University, and Pisces Molecular for making this possible. And thank you for your time. Yeah, I was wondering on the eDNA, first of all, great sample size, but uh, on the eDNA, you mentioned that heat and UV light can impact themselves. Is there a seasonality uh, impact to when you might take your samples and measure versus uh, from an environmental standpoint of how much, you know, how warm it is outside ambient temperature and how much direct sunlight versus the season of the year at which the lice might reproduce? So your question is, does the time of year matter for taking yeah. the sample? Um, I think it does, but the issue is if we take it in the winter, um, conditions are going to be more dangerous. It's going to be a lot of snowpack. It's going to be a lot harder to get to these sites. Some of them will be inaccessible altogether. So really, summertime is the best time to do it. Um, I'd say maybe earlier in the morning would be better whenever there's less sun, less heat, a little cooler. Yeah, good question. We have a question on Zoom. Julie Donahue wants to know what was your favorite location to visit throughout your survey and why? Um, I'd say probably Whale Creek in the San Juans. It was a really unique location. It was hard to get to. Um, we ended, actually ended up getting lost. <laughs> so we wandered around the San Juans all day, um, saw a moose and some cool mushrooms. It was interesting. Um, and we actually didn't find the creek at first. It was a huge to do, but it was a really cool environment and it was a cool challenge and having to hike in with all that equipment was a very unique experience. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just reintroduce myself and my project. My name is Dylan Sampson McKenna, uh, MS in Ecology candidate. And my project is titled Longitudinal Changes in Human Hunted and Unhunted Species Occupancy in a Honduran Cloud Forest, a pre and post COVID 19 comparison. Which is a little bit of a mouthful. Some background. Um, so, forest ecosystem services, I'm defining as any positive benefits that an ecosystem provides to people, namely, uh, carbon sequestration, nutrient cycling, weather regulation, erosion and flood prevention, and some ecotourism and educational opportunities as well. Mammals play a big role in facilitating these ecosystem services, mainly through their interactions with other species and the environment. Um, examples of this are mammals serving as predators and prey for other species, um, controlling disease, cycling nutrients through soil turnover and providing other habitats um, by just altering the landscape, as well as seed dispersal, which promotes forest regeneration. Um, as a result, like mammal diversity promotes ecosystem health and therefore mammal species conservation is a critical part of forest management and preservation. So poaching, I'm defining as any direct illegal, unregulated, or ecologically harmful wildlife removal by humans, regardless of the purpose. The threat here is biodiversity loss through defaunation, which has been shown to lead to species extinction, extirpation, spread of disease, and opening niches for invasive species to come into ecosystems. The main motivation for people to conduct poaching activity is for cultural significance, uh, resource extraction, food insecurity, economic insecurity, and human wildlife conflicts, such as um, domestic versus like domestic animals being negatively influenced or taken by predation, basically. Um, all of these motivations broadly stem from cultural or economic incentives, however. Um, so some economics incentives came up during the COVID-19 pandemic, as we know. Um, during COVID-19, there was redirected environmental funding, lowered attention to environmental issues, relaxed environmental regulations, restrictions to conservation agency functioning, lowered ecotourism, and a lot of COVID-19 induced unemployment. So in 2020 alone, there were estimated 120 million newly impoverished um, people 
So this created a lot of economic pressure and made me interested in um, how poaching might change as a result of these pressures. So my objectives and hypotheses going into this, four main objectives. The first to examine occupancy changes over pre and post COVID-19 years. And two, to identify the indicated effects of our covariates on human hunted and unhunted species occupancy. Three, to compare any covariate trends between these groups. And lastly, to discuss any extraneous factors that might also be affecting group occupancy. And our hypothesis, I'll just quote it for you. The unique circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic have increased poaching activity within our study area between pre and post COVID-19 years and our group occupancy trends will reflect this increase. Our study area is Kasuko National Park mapped out on the right of the screen. And let me just get some. It is a 234 square kilometer cloud forest located in Northwestern Honduras. It is located in the Marandon mountain range and part of its identity as a cloud forest mean that it has a really high elevation gradient, which makes it even more um, particularly biodiverse. It has 966 identified species as of 2020, 362 of which are Mesoamerican endemics and 49 of which are only found within this small mountain range. It provides many ecosystem services to the nearby city of San Pedro Sula, which is the second largest city in Honduras of about 1 million people. Services include weather regulation, erosion, and flood control, um, providing ecotourism and research opportunities, as well as sequestering 3.5 million megagrams of carbon. Main threats to this park include poaching, deforestation, climate change, and human development, kind of all the classic threats to wildlife and biodiversity. Our covariate selection include year elevation, canopy cover and distance to roads. Um, we also include day and time of day and coordinates as detection error covariates. Um, these are all chosen based off of the literature and our ability to sample for these covariates. Um, they're all shown to have pretty strong associations with mammal occupancy. We separated our species in the park into three separate groups, the first being a human group in which we include domestic dogs and humans. We included dogs in this group because in Kasuko National Park, dogs are only associated with hunting and really close proximity to people. So there's pretty much no chance that a dog's gonna be out there by itself, just living in the woods, not associated with humans. We also have a hunted species group, including the lowland paca, nine-banded armadillo, red brocket, white-tailed deer, collared peccary, and Baird's tapir. Um, except for this tapir photo in the corner, these are all photos that were taken during our season. In the bottom left, we have a paca, collared peccary, Baird's tapir here, and then this is a very blurry photo of a nine-banded armadillo that we, that we caught. And then our third group includes the unhunted species, mantle howler monkey, Virginia possum, the Terra, which is this nice weasel guy up here, um, the ocelot, the margay, photographed in the middle, skunk, white-nosed coati, photographed very blurrily here, uh, jaguar, kinkajou, cougar, and the jaguar. In collecting our data, we basically separated it into field data collection and some geospatial data collection. In the field, we sent teams of two or more trained observers out to record different spore um, of mammals down to the species level. Any spore that was not identifiable to the species level or not of mammalian origin or replicated was omitted from our data. Um, these include food, den sites, prints, trails, all these sorts of things. Um, and then for our geospatial data, it was analyzed in ArcGIS Pro and mainly consisted of um, percent canopy cover and elevation and distance to roads. We analyzed all of our data after we gathered it in, using occupancy analyses. Occupancy analyses are used to quantify covariate and presence absence data. 
um, it accounts for imperfect detection and it's suitable for our data um, because our data includes replicate surveys, presence absence data, and um, is also site specific. We analyzed our data in the SB occupancy R package because it uh, accounts for spatial autocorrelation, which was a factor. And in all, we ended up analyzing 765 models. In the end, we only included the single covariate or additive effects models um, to avoid autocorrelation. And our final output was a list of WAIC weighted coefficients. The following results are going to show graphs based on these results. So for our human group, we can see that year and quadratic elevation had a positive correlation with human occupancy, while distance to roads, elevation, and percent canopy cover had a pretty negative relationship with human occupancy. So for our hunted species, we can see that year and distance roads had a really pretty strongly positive effect on hunted species occupancy. Elevation, a slightly less um, significant or dramatic positive effect on occupancy. And then a somewhat neutral relationship between quadratic elevation and canopy cover and hunted species occupancy. Looking at unhunted species, we can see there was very weak correlation or directional correlation between any of our covariates and unhunted species. Um, quadratic elevation was not in any of the top models, so we omitted that from this. Um, there was a slight positive relationship between elevation and unhunted species occupancy, and a slightly negative relationship between year and unhunted species occupancy. So for our conclusions, I'll restate our hypothesis for you. Um, the unique circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic have increased poaching activity within our study area between pre and post COVID-19 years. Our results show actually, so we refute our hypothesis based on our results because our results strongly suggest that poaching decreased in the Eastern portion of Kasuko National Park, our study area, since the COVID-19 pandemic began in 2020. Um, this is globally uncommon of a trend, especially in areas where bushmeat hunting is a source of sustenance for people. Um, as a result, we say that the effects of COVID-19 on poaching activity are super context specific and not always predictable. So for example, in Honduras, poaching is done for recreation um, and kind of a pastime sort of thing. So during the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased economic pressures associated with it, people were not super interested in investing their money in going out and poaching. Um, there was also an increase in patrol presence in Kasuko National Park. So Panthera is an organization that partners with Kasuko National Park with the aim of um, protecting large cats. And their presence increased the human occupancy, but also decreased the poaching presence, which resulted in the increased hunted species presence that we see. Call for further research is to run a study on the western side of Kasuko National Park to provide a complete picture of mammal occupancy in Kasuko since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Okay, that's all I got for you, except for my acknowledgments. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my advisor, Dr. Madeline Vandekerk, and my committee members, Tom Martin and Dr. Garrett Smith, also Operation Wallacea and Western Colorado University. Yes. Thanks. Um, were you aware of like the cultural things associated with coaching? in Honduras before you started your study? Or like, if you didn't know, like, would you have changed your hypothesis if you didn't know? Yeah, so the question is, did I know of the Honduran context of poaching as it being a recreational kind of sport culture um, or not? And would that have changed my hypothesis going in had I known that? So I came up with this hypothesis pretty much immediately after COVID started because I was planning to go back to Kasuko anyway. 
just for like fun to do some research. But um, in March of 2020, I came up with this. So I had very little, like I had this hypothesis kind of immediately um, very early on. So it's been a long road to actually get down there. So I formed my hypothesis super early on. And once I started actually doing the research, I realized the context, but I stuck with my hypothesis anyway, because it is a really common trend for poaching to increase um, as a result of COVID. So it was worth looking at. Anyone else? Yeah. Do you think there's other factors besides the increase in patrol? Is there education within the Kazuka forest that can be applicable to other areas See that saw an increase in poaching? Yeah, so the question is, are there other factors besides the increase in patrol presence that would have decreased poaching? Um, so definitely the economic investment in poaching specific to Honduras um, prevented a lot of people from going out there. Also the remoteness of this park, it makes it very hard to get to for people. They need to spend like days out there hunting um, if they decide to do that. Um, so Panther is definitely a huge part of it. There's also a chance that um, there's increased poaching and deforestation activity on the Western side of the park, which we weren't able to assess, causing animals to kind of um, congregate on the eastern side where we studied. So it could be an effect of just migratory patterns, um, which again is why I would like someone to do a project that studies the entire park as a whole so I can really have a stronger conclusion. Well done. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Shane Kowinski, and my project is titled Modeling Forest Understory Temperatures as a Function of Canopy Cover and Topography. <clears throat> Forests are very Three unique and diverse ecosystems. ecosystems, and one of the reasons that they are so diverse is their ability to buffer the understory from extreme temperatures. And when you couple this buffering uh, capability with other variables such as elevation and slope aspect, they could actually create microclimates that decouple themselves from the larger regional climate of that region or of that area. And this is really important in the face of climate change because it could provide a refuge for species to occupy with this increase of temperatures that we are seeing. So in the southwestern United States and southwestern Colorado specifically, rising temperatures are the biggest threat to these ecosystems. And it's actually causing species to relocate and change their distribution patterns along with ecosystems as a whole. However, some of these you know, predictions or, or outlooks may be pessimistic and very negative and wrongfully so because they overlook the, the intricacies of a forested and, and uh, mountainous region, uh, i.e. those uh, microclimates I was talking about. Uh, so that gets me to my project and what I was looking at. The main objective of this study is to understand how forest understory temperatures are influenced by canopy cover and more specifically does increased canopy cover um, mitigate or um, protect the understory from extreme temperature variations. And along with that buffering capacity, how do other variables such as elevation, aspect, and canopy height affect that buffering capability? And what is the significance of all of this or of that buffering uh, effect? And, you know, I kind of touched on it already, but it could provide refuge for some of these species and could build resiliency into these forested ecosystems as we see temperatures continue to rise. So my study was located in the Taylor Basin. Uh, that's about 35 miles northeast of here. And it's a very unique area, especially for Colorado, because it contains one of the largest remaining stands of lodgepole pine forest that has not been affected by wildfire or bark beetle. Uh, so it's very unique. And the elevations range between 9 and 11,000 feet, at least from my study locations were located. And those of you who are familiar with it, I don't know if you can see that dark blob in the center, that's that's the Taylor Reservoir. And on the northeast and south side, those red dots were the study plot locations that were randomly placed on this aerial image. And so how did we conduct this study? Well, in 2020, a former MEM student took these temperature loggers that are about the size of an old flip phone, and he placed them at each one of these sites. Uh, There's a total of 47. And when he placed them, he put them underneath these shields here. They can see in his pictures to the right. And those shields are, reflect the solar radiation so that the logger uh, only records the air temperature and isn't uh, influenced by that solar radiation. Uh, 
and they replaced 15 centimeters off of the forest floor uh, to get to get the reading there. And they replaced in 2020 and they were maintenance one year later in 2021, made sure that they're still working. And then 2022, I came along and extracted these loggers out of the field, maintenance them and then placed them back in a new location. Uh, so I have two full years worth of data uh, and they're pretty uh, extensive Excel sheets. Uh, like I said, they record a temperature every 30 minutes. So you download an Excel sheet from one year, it'd be like 20,000 lines deep, uh, but pretty cool to work with. And when I uh, visited each one of these sites, I took the GPS location with this GNSS geo device, and that just uses multiple satellites to record the location at sub meter accuracy. Um, and then I took those GPS locations and plotted them into ArcGIS and was able to extract the canopy cover and slope aspect values to add to my data set. And how did I perform the analysis on this? Well, I used multiple and simple linear regressions to identify a relationship between these variables and the forest understory temperatures. And I extracted the temperatures from the months of June, July, and August. Uh, this is when you see the biggest temperature variations and extreme temperatures. Um, and this is when important physiological processes take place for, for different plant species. So I decided to look at those months. And when I looked at those months, I took the mean, the overall mean, that I looked at the maximum, the minimum, and the range of, of each day and each month. And so with that, we'll get into the result here. So initially, I took the overall mean of each month. And as you can see here, it had a significant relationship with canopy height. Uh, so as canopy height increases along the x-axis, you can see that the mean temperature actually decreased. And I believe canopy cover was significant as well, but it didn't, it didn't fit as well as this model. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting result, but significant. And next I looked at the maximum temperature. So again, I, I extracted the maximum temperature for each day of each month and then took the mean of that value. And as you can see here, this is a multiple linear regression. So on the y-axis, you have canopy height. On the x-axis, you have canopy cover. And then that color gradient, that darker color is a lower maximum temperature. So as canopy cover increases and as canopy height increases, you can see that there's a lot more dark plot or dark uh, dots in that right hand corner. So that means dense canopy and high canopy or a tall canopy uh, reduce that, that maximum temperature in the understory. And this is a really cool result. This is probably the most significant model I was able to get from this data. So uh, it's a really cool graph. Next, I looked at the minimum temperature again from each day of each month. And there really wasn't a whole lot of relationship with any variables other than the elevation. And as elevation increases, you can see that that minimum temperature decreases or um, increases as well, I'm sorry, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive to that from what you would think. But if you, you know, think about nighttime and looking at low, uh, low hanging valleys and whatnot, some of that cold air might settle there. So as you go up in elevation, you have, might actually get a little bit warmer. And lastly, I looked at the range of temperatures from each day. And so the significant value with this was canopy cover. So as canopy cover increased, that range decreased. Uh, so this, this is a really cool model too, because it shows that an increase in canopy cover actually uh, buffers the understory from extreme temperature variations and ranges. Uh, so that's a pretty significant result as well. And uh, cool graph. And so conclusions, well, canopy cover and canopy height are definitely significant when predicting forest understory temperatures and identifying where these microclimates may exist. And, you know, this information can help inform future land managers and silvicultural practices to, um, you know, be better make better decisions and try to preserve some of this resiliency into these forested ecosystems. And if you see on this map here, I create this using ArcGIS. And you can reassign the values to certain variables. So for instance, if you have a canopy cover at 70%, you can reassign that and say it's a you know, number three, which would be good. And you can do that for all the variables. And then it goes through and each pixel in that graph, it calculates all those values and it gives you back a, an overall number. And so the green areas would be areas with higher canopy cover, uh, taller canopy height, higher in elevation. And this map is just kind of to try to predict or show where some of these microclimates and cooler temperatures may exist in that Taylor Basin area. So I thought that was a cool map. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. I just want to give a big thank you to all my sponsors and especially Dr. Coop who, who brought these sponsors together and, and made this project possible. And
I'd like to thank, thank my mentor, Dr. Garrett Smith, and my community sponsor, Nate Seward, and thank everyone who's here and who was involved in this project. So, for questions. On that weighted temperature suitability index, what were some of the factors that you uh, that were analyzed in there? Yeah, so the question was, what is the variables in this weighted temperature suitability index model? And I used elevation, slope aspect, and canopy cover in this model. And I the weighted one is I put more weight on the canopy cover after I found that's a good predictor variable. Uh, so it just you know kind of refines that graph, and you can, as you can see, there's less green in it. So uh, you know, th thinner or, or more dense canopy cover in those areas. What are some of the ways that you see this data helping inform like better land management practices? Uh, the question was, how can this data better inform land management practices? And, you know, if we can identify what areas uh, lower or what variables lower these temperatures in the understory. So say, you know, maybe there's a sweet spot, you know, 60% canopy cover uh, is the threshold for lowering these temperatures. Uh, doing silver cultural practices, maybe we can thin an area instead of clear cut it or, or something along those lines to try to retain some of that, that resiliency in the forest. Um. All right, well, hello, everybody. Um, once again, I'm Caitlin Harvey. I'm in the MS Ecology Program, and my project was on assessing alpine plant community dynamics and climate in the Senator Beck Basin in Colorado. So just a bit of background information for you. The Senator Beck Basin is an isolated area located in southwestern Colorado in the San Juan mountain range. And this area is owned by the, or managed by the US Forest Service. And so in 2004, they established a vegetation study to assess changes in vegetation data over time. So to do this, they established 22 transects along an elevational gradient in order to collect field data on vegetation composition and abundance for the years 2004, 2009, 2014, and 2021. As part of my addition to the project, I added abiotic data collection and research as part of my contribution. So I included abiotic various variables of soil moisture, elevation, uh, GPS coordinates, as well as snow presence. And I also incorporated remotely sensed data through Google Earth Engine for the variables of plant growth and productivity, which is EVI snow index, which is just annual snowpack in this region, as well as the land surface temperature, which is more or less self-explanatory. And if you look at this digital elevation model on the right-hand side, you'll see that the basin itself is outlined in black, and then all of these blue dots are those research transects that were surveyed. Our two main objectives for this project, the first was to assess plant community compositional change from that field data that the Forest Service has had access to, as well as the second objective, which is assessing relationships between compositional topographic setting, as well as climate variation. So for our methods, they were broken down into three broad categories. The first one was assessing community structure and environmental relationships. For that, we were really looking to see if the compositional makeup of these communities and transects had changed over time. So to do that, we did something called non-metric multidimensional scaling. And we also wanted to create our own established community types within the basin based on their environmental drivers and environmental relationships between them. Our second category was to assess environmental variation across sample types. So for that, we performed a simple linear regression of those remotely sensed variables to see if there was a significant linear trend over time. <clears throat> 
And then finally, we wanted to see what the changes in species frequency and distribution over time would be. And to do that, we used frequency data as well as elevational mean data for individual species, as well as community types and functional types, which we classified as woody species, graminoids, or forbs, to see if they had shifted in range or frequency over time. For our NMS community analysis, this graph on the left-hand side is essentially showing points for every transect that was surveyed, and each color of those points is representing a different year. So when you're looking at this graph, if we were to be showing directional change of the species composition within all of these transects, what you would likely see are the lighter colors from the earlier sampling years on one side of the graph, and then having every single transect point move further away from its original position as years go on. As you're looking at this graph, you can see that that's not really the case that we found. We found that these transects are more or less not moving in any sort of directional pattern. And if they are moving, it's pretty minimally. And a lot of them seem to have shifted back to relatively their original positions over time instead of moving farther away. And then this graph on the right is that same NMS graph, but now we've taken all those transects points based on their similar positions and similar species makeup and transformed them into their own specific community types based on environmental relationships. So the closer these points are to each other on this graph, the more similar they are in their compositional makeup of species. And that is how we came up with these four distinct communities. On the top left, we have our dry slope community, and we also have the species that these communities are dominated by, which for the dry slope community is our soft arnica. And then on the bottom left, we have the shrubby riparian community, which is dominated by marsh marigold. On the bottom right, we have our wet meadow community, which is dominated by American bistort. And then finally, the highest elevation and driest elevation area on the top right, we have the alpine steppe community, which is dominated by alpine avens or geomrossii. And these are just the species I mentioned, so you could have some context. These species on the left-hand side are our wetter elevation and soil moisture gradient species. So we have our marsh marigold on the top and our American bistort on the bottom left. And then on the right side, we have our drier species, so our soft arnica on the top right, and then finally our alpine avens here on the bottom right. So when we wanted to come up with relationships to community and environment, we were really trying to see which of these environmental variables are the main drivers of community composition within this basin. What we found is that elevation and soil moisture are the two most significant environmental variables when classifying communities in this area. And we found that through correlation testing, which is what that R variable is to the right. And we also found significant relationships between environmental variables to themselves. Specifically, we found that EBI was negatively correlated with soil moisture, and we also found that land surface temperature was negatively correlated with snowpack. And these graphs on the bottom are that same exact NMS ordination plot I showed you previously, but now they've been overlaid with contour data just to show where the transect distribution is for elevation, soil moisture percentages, and topographic position index. So essentially, we classified these communities based on how wet or dry they are, and as well as how low or high their elevational distribution is. So we found that our dry slope community and our shrubby riparian community are both lower in elevation, but they exhibit very different gradients of soil moisture. Um, conversely, we have our wet meadow and our alpine steppe communities, which are both very high in elevation, but are exhibiting that same difference in high and low soil moisture gradients. And because we found a negative correlation between EVI, which is our plant growth, and soil moisture, the main takeaway that we can kind of infer from this data is that the wetter community, so our wet meadow and our shrubby riparian communities, are much more likely to see an increase in their plant productivity and growth over time as they become drier. However, what's not conclusive, 
is whether or not those drier communities are going to, in the long term, be able to sustain higher levels of plant growth and productivity as they reach their lower soil moisture tolerance limits over time. So now we have our linear regression. And each of these graphs represent those remotely sensed variables I've been talking about. And what we found is that first, there was a significant increase in the overall plant productivity and growth within the collective study site. We also found that there was a significant decrease in the growing season snowpack over time. And interestingly enough, I would have expected to see a significant increase in land surface temperatures since the decrease in snowpack was so significant, but that was not actually the case. And while though land surface temperature did show an increase, this was not to a significant degree. And then finally, we just wanted to track those same remotely sensed values across our community types here, which is what these box graphs are showing. And I would have suspected that each community responded a little bit differently to these changes in climate or experienced different levels or responses to the same increases or decrease. And that wasn't necessarily the case here. Every community seemed to increase in their EDI, decrease in their snowpack, and increase in their land surface temperature. The only difference between these was the degree of those increases or de decreases within communities. And even still, they were pretty minute. So for example, even though every community increased in their EDI, the wet meadow community exhibited the largest increase, which would make sense if there was a negative correlation between soil moisture and plant growth as this wet community is drying out over time. For land surface temperature, everybody exhibited increases in their surface temperature, but the alpine steppe community, which is our high elevation community, exhibited the highest level of increase of land surface temperature. And then finally, for um, our dry slope community and NDSI, they are the community that saw the largest decrease in their growing season annual snowpack. For our frequency data and elevational means, we ran a randomization test for 188 different species, as well as functional groups and community types. Because we were running around 10,000 iterations of that randomization test for every single species, we wanted to make sure that those significant p-values it was spitting out were actually significant because there was a change and not due to random statistical chance. So what we did is we adjusted those p-values using a more conservative method to see if those significant values would still hold up, and they did not. So for example, you can see this chart on the left on what those p-values looked like originally, and then when we adjusted them with that more conservative estimate. And we found that none of these species for any of the year sampling pairs that we compared to each other exhibited significant changes in their elevation or their frequency over time. Um, similarly, we did not find significant results for the elevational distribution of functional groups or community types as well. So all in all, this area kind of threw me for a loop. I was expecting to see that comparing this data to other data and studies in Colorado and global mountainous regions, I would have thought that species would be responding faster to a changing climate in the San Juans. And at least in the Senator Beck Basin, this doesn't seem to be the case. These species are exhibiting a more resilient response to a changing climate than species in basins in other areas in the same geological area of the San Juans. So what we found was that the snowpack for the growing seasons every year has significantly declined, while the plant productivity and growth has significantly increased over time. However, we are not really seeing the directional change that we would have thought we would have seen for the whole entire community. And so our biggest takeaway is being able to sort of infer or predict that over time, the wetter communities in the Senator Beck Basin will likely respond better to changes in climate because they will likely experience, at least in the short term, increases in their plant productivity as they dry out versus drier areas that are already near their lower moisture gradient limits. 
And then finally, I just wanted to acknowledge my committee members as well as my advisor. Um, and then I wanted to acknowledge all of the data collection volunteers that helped me over the last few years, as well as the organizations pointed here that were able to make this study possible. Thank you. Questions? I have a question. I was wondering if you have any idea or guess kind of at what level of snowpack or drying out of the soil where we would start to see an inverse of this increased plant growth and actually see a big decrease in plant growth because it's too dry now? Yeah, that's a great question. So to reiterate that, at what level of snowpack would you be likely to see this inverse reaction that other studies have found in this area? And while I don't have the specific number for that, um, what I am seeing is that it's it's less of like how much snowpack is there on a year to year basis and more of like how long is this trend of snow decline occurring. So the longer that this trend is sustained of a decreased snowpack, that's when you are more than likely to see those consequences from a changing climate over time. So it's less and yet less of like a year to year variation on snowpack and more so how long has that decreasing trend been continuing? Good question on Zoom. Julie Donahue wants to know, do you think variation in topography, such so low lying areas on slopes or bridges on those slopes, all in the same small area result in different communities and compositions of flowers? Yes, absolutely. So to reiterate that question, does topography impact biodiversity or the creation of sort of niche habitats within areas like the Senator Beck Basin. And I've actually seen a lot of evidence to support that through my studies on other alpine ecosystems. It seems like areas such as the Senator Beck Basin that are varied in their topographical landscape are actually able to hold micro climates, microclimates and microhabitats to foster these small um, sort of alpine refugia locations for these plants and can make them more resilient to a, an overall change in climate variables over time. Hi, my name is Alyssa Worsham. My project is titled When the Wilderness Burns, and today we'll be talking about fire management in designated wilderness areas and also making the case for prescribed fire. To start, what is wilderness? In 1964, the Wilderness Act uh, set aside 9.1 million acres of undeveloped federal lands to be preserved for future generations. Today, the wilderness preservation system is made up of over 112 million acres. It's managed by each of the four federal land management agencies, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, and Fish and Wildlife Service. And we can see that it's concentrated in the western half of the United States, along with the rest of the federal lands in our country. Um, wilderness is intended to be managed uh, to limit human intervention as much as possible. And this includes strict prohibitions on things like permanent structures, mechanized equipment, and motorized vehicles. And we'll see that this later plays into how fire management occurs in wilderness. Next, what is prescribed fire? Prescribed fire, also called controlled burning, is uh, or involves the intentional manager lit fires, uh, which serve one of two purposes or both purposes, restoring fire dependent ecosystems and reducing hazardous vegetation that fuels wildfires. Prescribed fire is one of many different types of fire management strategies that we see used on public lands, and it is neither prohibited by the Wilderness Act nor by agency policies specific to fire management. However, we see that it is rarely implemented within wilderness, which is where my project comes in. Uh, this project attempted to answer the question, what is the appropriate role of prescribed fire in wilderness? Many wilderness areas, though not all, evolved with the help of fire over time. Uh, prior to European colonization, we see that historical fire regimes were shaped by a combination of both natural or lightning ignited fires, as well as human ignited fires by indigenous peoples. Over a century of fire exclusion in these areas, however, has created a fire deficit on many landscapes, including wilderness areas, which then makes them less resilient to uh, larger wildfires that we're seeing as a result of climate change. <clears throat> 
And as fire behavior uh, continues to shift because of climate change, fire management in, in all public lands and especially wilderness areas uh, will play an increasingly important role in preserving those areas. So to answer this question, my project involved three distinct phases. The first, like my co-panelist, was research, but that is about where these similarities end. Uh, this research was mostly qualitative, including surveys and interviews of current land managers. We then hosted a workshop here at Western Colorado University in order to present our research findings and really talk about the management implications and identify next steps, more specifically related to prescribed fire and wilderness. And finally, we developed a white paper to present the outcomes of our workshop um, and to present recommendations to address barriers to prescribed fire. And this was meant for agency officials and lawmakers um, to help change policy. So the first phase of the project was research where we first developed an online survey. Um, this was sent out to wilderness and fire managers around the country. We received 131 responses from all four wilderness management agencies and from all regions of the country. The survey provided a mix of both quantitative and qualitative data and uh, was really more broad to understand how fire management is currently happening in wilderness. We then followed up these surveys with interviews to dive deep into specific topics such as ideal conditions, barriers to management, and specific case studies. We conducted, recorded, and transcribed over 22 hours of interview data, um, which we then analyzed via a qualitative data coding software in order to pull out the key themes from that data. We had a couple different research limitations for this, however. We had a relatively small sample size, as you can see from the number of survey and interview participants. Additionally, uh, research participants were self-selected and we relied on snowball sampling in order to get them. Due to these limitations, the research itself evaluated the relative frequencies of common themes within the data, um, instead of focusing on more quantitative statistical analyses like you've heard about previously. So in order to categorize what we heard from both survey and interview participants, we developed four research questions. Essentially, these were to tell the story of how fire is currently managed in wilderness, what the decision-making processes and factors are for those management decisions, what the ideal conditions would be according to land managers, and what barriers may exist to meeting ideal conditions. First of all, related to fire management, we heard that full suppression, which means putting a fire out as quickly as possible, is the dominant management strategy in wilderness. We also see that this is the dominant management strategy outside of wilderness. Um, on the other hand, prescribed fire is used least often in wilderness areas, and all fire management depends mostly on geography, including things like wilderness size and remoteness, and values at risk, so things like property and life. The next question looked at decision-making factors. Uh, we found that decision-making relied most heavily on risk and safety. That's public safety, firefighter safety, and threats of litigation. Uh, generally, this was deemed to be more important than things like wilderness qualities. So the reason that these areas were designated in the first place. Uh, we also heard that among the different wilderness management agencies, the interpretation of the Wilderness Act changed how fire management happened, depending on who managed a specific uh, wilderness area. Third, we asked every interview participant the same question. What are the ideal conditions? Are we there? And if not, how do we get there? We heard from both fire and wilderness managers that fire should or wilderness should have fire where appropriate with as little human intervention as possible. And that these quote unquote good fires should have both public and agency support. However, we then heard that neither one of these ideal conditions are currently the reality. Um, and that brings us to the next question on barriers. So what is preventing the uh, effective and ideal management conditions in wilderness for fire are primarily administrative, so staffing and funding. Again, this transcends, transcends wilderness areas um, that applies to fire management in all public lands, as well as public perception. Uh, again, risk aversion, aversion was a huge theme, as well as lack of social license. To follow up our research, the second phase of the project involved a workshop held here at Western Colorado University. The purpose was to ground truth our research results and really hear from both land or both wilderness and fire managers in the same room um, what potential implications our research results had on management. 
So this was a two-day workshop. We invited folks from agencies, tribes, and nonprofits. We had 21 participants um, and tried to include a broad range of background and experience. So everywhere from on the ground fire and wilderness specialists up through program managers who are responsible for high level decision making and policy interpretation. The workshop had a very structured uh, facilitated process led by Dr. Melanie Armstrong. We started with creating shared understandings among the group because we had such diverse experiences. This included a presentation of our research that we completed, as well as case studies from workshop participants themselves for either success stories or lessons learned. Notably, one of the most important uh, case studies we heard was from two tribal or from two indigenous fire practitioners. The first was from the Yurok tribe in Northern California, the second from the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. And they talked about how indigenous cultural burning really informed a lot of their land management and ended up being um, a key theme throughout the rest of the workshop and then through the rest of our deliverables as well. Next, we grouped folks into uh, discussion groups that were based on our barriers we identified in our research and had them talk about additional issues and potential priority actions to address these barriers. We then brought everyone back together um, and did some iterative, iterative rounds of review and revisions on these recommendations um, and eventually combined them into a draft white paper and sought group approval from everyone. The third phase of the project is the white paper. Uh, a white paper is a focused informational document that presents facts and takes a stance on a complex issue. They're used to inform decision makers and educate the public on these complex issues. Our white paper uh, was an interagency paper focused on presenting the outcomes of the workshop and uh, really highlighting the barriers and opportunities for prescribed fire in wilderness areas. The white paper is endorsed by all of the workshop participants and includes eight key themes. Here are the key themes. Uh, each one of them has two to three specific uh, recommendations for action items. Uh, each of these has a little bit of a different audience. Some are to policymakers, some are to lawmakers, and some are to managers um, who work on the ground every day. They range from acknowledging indigenous use and management of wilderness areas, including the use of indigenous cultural burning and traditional ecological knowledge in things like policy language, scientific literature, and public messaging, um, to other themes and recommendations that are more broadly focused on fire management in general. Uh, so things that are administrative in nature, like training and staffing and funding, um, and also public messaging. The white paper is currently undergoing a policy review at the Forest Service headquarters in Washington, DC. We hope that it will be uh, published later this spring. Um, and also we hope that this paper will essentially land on the desks of some really important decision makers uh, up the chain of command all the way from agency chiefs to department secretaries. With that, uh, I'd like to give thanks to the people who helped me throughout this project. Dagny Signorelli was my research partner. We spent a lot of nights closing down the library. Um, also advisors, Dr. Melanie Armstrong and Dr. Jonathan Coop for their help throughout the project. My project sponsor was Sean Parks at the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute. My community sponsor is Dana Skelly with the Forest Service. I'd also like to thank MEM faculty and staff, especially Lindsay for her help planning our workshop, um, as well as Dr. Kate Clark and Dr. Jess Young for their leadership and mentorship in the program. Um, and lastly, my family, friends, and coworkers, thank you for your support and your patience with me over the past two years. Questions? There was a question online. Um, actually, now there's a couple. <laughs> Matthew Eschett said, who made the December fire workshop logo? It's beautiful. <laughs> Our one and only Lindsay Dolezal. Yes. Um, and then one more question online. How well did you find that the individual interviews conducted in the first phase informed the workshop and white paper? And what would you change, if anything, looking back at that first phase? Uh, first of all, I would not have used Zoom to record the interviews. The transcription on those is terrible. Microsoft Teams does a way better job uh, of transcriptions. We ended up having to do a lot of like reading through hours of these interviews to try to make sure and like listening at the same time to make sure it matched up so that we could use their quotes. Um, so that that was one. Uh, 
we did have a lot of, or we had some overlap between our interview participants and our workshop participants. Um, and so that, that really helped because we picked them knowing that they had really important stories to tell, like case studies where things uh, were either in progress, like current projects or things that have been going well for several decades. Um, and so we kind of knew that coming in uh, to our workshop and knew what to highlight. Who's Sally next? Um, with uh, support for having fire in wilderness, do you see um, that support going over into other things coming into wilderness that people normally don't want in wilderness, such as bike riding, <coughs> chainsaws, and that type of thing? Personally, or from our research? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the, the question was, do you see if uh, things like fire are allowed to expand within wilderness, do you see that then influencing other prohibited uses like mountain biking and stuff like that, right? Um, short answer, no, personally. Um, I, I just attended a, a workshop um, as the National Wilderness Workshop, and there were some really interesting conversations about that exactly, where um, I think there can be like an old guard of wilderness people um, who, who really adhere to the strict, uh, strict interpretations of the Wilderness Act. Um, however, and not that I think it's like necessarily loosening up, but there's been some really interesting thought exercises on, well, what do wilderness areas actually represent when um, indigenous peoples manage the land for thousands of years, including with the use of fire? And then they were essentially uh, like, you know, the, the line was drawn around them and then we decided that certain things could or couldn't happen within them. So in, in my mind, fire uh, kind of occupies its own space there uh, because it was something that was previously used in wilderness areas and in certain ones, obviously they're all different. Um, but things like mountain bikes weren't used for thousands of years before uh, the Europeans came. So in my mind, it's different. And I think it's also just becoming um, more mainstream conversation to kind of talk about those things. Thank you to each of our panel members. Really impressive work. We have the chance now to direct questions to individuals on the panel or to the panel as a whole. So please feel free. Questions in the room or on Zoom? Who would like to start us off? Peter. I'm curious how easy it is to remove gill lice from, from gills. And do you ever damage the gills in that process? Yeah, so the question was, how difficult is it to remove gill lice? Um, actually, not that hard. Um, sometimes people just used a pencil and just popped it right out of the gill. Um, other times, I usually preferred to cut it out with surgical scissors. I would just cut it out right above the attachment organ and just pop it in the ethanol, and that was that. Oh, yes. Um, do you mean rem the removal of the gill lice? Does that damage the fish? Yeah. Um, sometimes if you pull the gill louse right out, yeah, it can cause a little bit of bleeding, but nothing worse than what the louse is already doing to the fish. Thank you. Others? We have a question from Melanie Armstrong. She asks, um, what advice would you give to future NEM students who want to influence policy? What are the challenges and opportunities to do so as a student? <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. Um, have patience. Uh, working with a lot of different government agencies, uh, there are a lot of hurdles that are somewhat bureaucratic in nature um, that have to do with things like funding for these projects, uh, like deliverables that you are allowed to publish and stuff like that. Um, it's something that I wasn't really aware of beforehand. However, I found it incredibly gratifying because uh, like not only did we do research, but we then developed things that the people who are in charge of making decisions uh, will kind of be forced to look at. And uh, policy doesn't change overnight. Uh, 
there's so much science out there that should be informing a lot of management decisions, but it takes a really long time. So it was kind of interesting to see that happen on a condensed time scale. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. A question for Shane. Um, I was curious if there, if you found that there's a relationship between um, like canopy coverage and canopy height and elevation, if that could have influenced some of your temperature data. Yeah, so the question was, does canopy cover, canopy height, and elevation influence some of that data? Yes, yeah, so I ran multiple regressions, and there was some significant results pairing all three of those variables together. Uh, but the graphs that I showed on the presentation were better fit models. Uh, so the fit and the variance was much higher on, on those multiple regression mo models. So, But there, there is a relationship between all three variables, yes. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? All your projects seem to be really dense and heavy science. What are some of the best practices you've found in really simplifying that and being able to communicate it on a kind of easier level for people to understand without, without using the really complex jargon models and data analytics? Say to this audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the question was, we had complex studies with heavy scientific um, results in there and how do we convey that easily to the public and I'd say it's just spending a lot of time with that data and with that research and trying to understand it the best that you can and then just simplify it down from there you know I definitely got bogged down a few times but you know looking at so many graphs but you know you just got to take a step back sometimes and realize what relationship you're looking at and you know simplify it down to that relationship and then go from there. Uh, yeah, I would say on top of that is just practice with reading how these interpretations have been relayed to audiences through similar work. And um, in my example, trying to explain plots is a lot easier than trying to explain the statistical analysis without a visual aid. So I would definitely say that including visual identifiers to help you kind of get everybody on board with what that analysis actually means is a lot easier than just spitting out a paragraph of really complicated sounding words. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think, yeah, just simplifying it to the appropriate level for your audience and then being ready with more information in case there is someone in the audience that asks like a really specific or complicated question that maybe um, wasn't shown in your, your presentation because you wanted to make it, you didn't want to bog everyone down with the terminology that you need to Yeah, just kind of cutting the fat, you don't need to tell everyone every step that you did to get to where you got, especially in a, in a panel like this. Any more questions? <laughs> I have another question for Alyssa from Ian Brown. He asks, did you find Western fire managers take into account or consider indigenous fire regimes when deciding what is natural, particularly following the effects of colonization on cultural fires? So the question is, did we find that Western fire managers took into account indigenous histories as natural in wilderness areas? Yeah, like was that it seems like it's framed as was it categorized that way? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the word natural I learned is very uh, as a very heavily loaded word. Um, in the Wilderness Act, it comes up specifically. It's one of the conditions that you monitor for. Uh, however, people define natural very differently, personally. Um, and it, within our interviews, when we heard from folks, almost every single person, regardless of like wilderness or fire uh, association, mentioned uh, the histories of the land that they've been working on and how they had or ha yeah, had been affected by indigenous use over time. Um, but there's not really a like structured pathway for you to kind of use that knowledge in um, decision making or management strategies right now, which is why that was kind of one of our main key themes in the white paper, which provided recommendations. Uh, how there needs to be a lot more thinking about how do we incorporate that kind of knowledge into uh, management. Kind of on the same line, another question from Destin. For you specifically, he asks, how do you see your project as a part of the movement for co-management of public land? 
Um, well, uh, again, I attended a workshop a couple of weeks ago that was was really interesting and focused specifically on um, indigenous histories in wilderness areas. And uh, one of the, I guess, surprising things was that there were a lot of uh, different tribal members there from all over the country. And the first thing that they always said was, we're not trying to repeal the Wilderness Act. Like there was this like misperception that in order to um, be considering indigenous management, you had to then repeal some of our uh, more modern day acts and stuff like that in order like that you couldn't have both. Um, and so it surprised me that that was such a large, uh, I guess, misperception and that it felt like it had to be addressed every time someone talked about it. Um, I'm rambling and forgot the original intent of the question. <laughs> Um, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> do you see your how do you see your project as part of the movement for co-management I guess I'll just say that I think fire is a really interesting application to focus on specifically, uh, kind of like I was answering Sally's question. It's something that was around beforehand, um, and we can point to that. We have scientific evidence of it. We see it in the the, the tree uh, scars and stuff like that. So it's it's something where we can like point to and say, maybe this is how things were, and maybe it's what we should be getting back towards. Um, other things I think are a little bit less uh, defined in terms of uh, like the land back movement and stuff like that. Um, but I think this is at least a starting point. We have time for more. Any other questions? Thanks, Brad. So with the, uh, with the awareness of CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Does that create a, a new reluctance or resistance to prescribed fires or even natural fires or indigenous fires? I mean, uh, that you're contributing to global warming by enhancing the wilderness? I would encourage you to turn around and talk to Dr. Jonathan Coop about this <laughs> in detail. Um, <laughs> However, a really uh, interesting quote that like comes to mind immediately from our interviews was that there is no no smoke option. Um, with the wildfires and stuff that we're seeing right now, things are burning at higher severity and stuff like that. that. That will continue to happen as we have landscapes that have not been uh, properly managed for a hundred years, fire has been suppressed for so long. Um, there are studies about whether or not prescribed fire produces less smoke and or as opposed to a wildfire and stuff like that. Um, it, one person we talked to said that that was relatively inconclusive. Um, but yeah, there is, there is no option for things not to burn, but if we can control where they happen, um, then essentially like we, we're not gonna see as destructive things happening, especially in wilderness areas uh, where you're preserving like very specific values. Dylan, there's a question for you. Julie Donahue asks, how did you define hunted versus unhunted? Did you think there would be hunting for trophies? Um, so the question is, how did I define hunted versus unhunted species in my group categorizations? Um, that was based on former um, one anecdotal evidence and interviews that I'd conducted um, with locals and also um, previous studies that had been done on the mammal communities within Kazuko National Park. So Operation Wallacea, who I was partnering with, they have a, a large body of like scientific work that they've produced based on the mammal data. And I consulted with the authors of those papers as well as locals to, to identify those groups. Um, as far as trophy hunting, this was another question, if there's trophy hunting in Kasuko National Park, not so much. Um, there's no real trophy species there. There's Baird's tapir, which is endangered and very big. It's like the largest, it is the largest Central American mammal, like 600 pounds or so, um, but they're not like taxidermied or anything like that. It's mainly for sport and recreation and um sustenance to some extent but it's not like a necessary food source any more julian okay one we have time for one last question anybody this is for caitlin hardy did you note in your studies any differences with uh, invasive species flourishing at the rate same rate as native species flourishing in the environmental studies 
Yes, so the question was, did I notice a difference between um, increases or de decreases in abundance or distribution of invasive species versus native species? Um, and the answer is no, which was also an interesting facet to the study is that many of these areas um, in other mountainous regions are being characterized by invasive species movement into higher elevations. And we did not personally find any statistically significant increases in abundance of these invasive species or the elevational distribution of them. Let's thank our panel.